Welcome everyone to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's first in a series to meet our DM drug developers. I'm Dr. Tanya Stevenson, the CEO of MDF, and I'm so glad you could join us today. I'm excited to kick off this series as we enter Rare Disease Month with our industry partner, Dyne Therapeutics. As a reminder, MDF's mission is to enhance quality of life for people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatments and a cure. Our work focuses on support and education, research and advocacy. MDF hosts many resources on our website. So as a reminder, we have toolkits and publications, clinical care guidelines, support group and Facebook chat details, a calendar of all of MDF's events and activities, and our digital academy, which hosts presentations and videos from DM experts from past events, including the MDF annual conferences. This series today is very exciting and a high request from many people in our community. It will continue the first Friday of each month at 12 p.m. Pacific, with one exception due to popular demand to meet as many drug developers as possible, we've added a bonus session on Wednesday, June 9th with Artex Biotech. To register for future sessions and ask questions of our DM drug developers, go to www.myotonic.org slash meet hyphen DM hyphen drug hyphen developers. Also new to 2021, MDF is working with our top DM experts to offer the Ask the Expert series, which will be held every third Friday of the month at 12 o'clock Pacific. This is a unique opportunity to ask questions of our clinical experts that your own clinical care team or healthcare, healthcare providers may not have the answers to. Our first session will begin Friday, February 19th focused on mobility, exercise, movement. So get your questions register, get your questions ready to register at www.myotonic.org slash ask hyphen expert hyphen series. If you haven't already registered for MDF's advocacy workshop to be held this Monday, February 8th at 12 o'clock Pacific, please go to myotonic.org slash b hyphen and hyphen advocate. As this is Rare Disease Month, we'll be focusing on advocating for more DM resources and research at the federal level. We'll include how to contact your congressional representatives, request and participate in virtual meetings with them, and how to develop longer term relationships with your elected officials. As a reminder, all of our sessions will be recorded and posted to MDF's Digital Academy within a week or so of the program. If you have any questions about this program or other MDF programs, please reach out via email or phone. Okay, so let's get down to what you're really here for today. So we are delighted to have Dyne Therapeutics join us today for our very first in our series. Uh, we've designed this presentation to answer many of the questions you submitted during the registration process. And they'll try to answer as many as they can, but you may also submit your questions during this presentation. So to submit questions today, please go down to your chat box on the screen and use the drop down to select questions for staff. So remember, use the chat box, drop down, send question to staff, and please know that not all questions can be answered for legal reasons or because some of the details are not, let, not yet public, so they're not ready to be shared by some of our partners. So I'd like to thank the Dyne team for being with us today and partnering with MDF to keep our community aware and hopeful, and I will let you take it from here. Good morning, everybody. We are so delighted to be talking with the myotonic dystrophy community today. It's obviously very near and dear to our hearts, and we're excited to share what we're doing and take your questions. And we're going to start with our Chief Executive Officer, Josh Brown. Josh, I'll hand it over to you. 
Thanks, Molly. Thanks everyone for joining. It's a great it's great to have the opportunity to speak with all of you today and discuss Dine's commitment to transforming the futures of people living with serious muscle diseases, and in particular our efforts in DM1. I'm joined by our co-founder and chief scientific officer, Ramesh Subramanian, our SVP of clinical development, Chris Mix, and Molly White, who many of you already know. On slide two, before I begin, just a reminder, as a public company, I'll be making some forward-looking statements in our presentation today that can involve certain risks and uncertainties. Uh, I have to say that, but uh, I want to now like to get into the real meat of the presentation on, on uh, our company and DM1. I'd like to start with our mission as it's core to who we are and what we do every day here at Dine. We are laser focused on muscle diseases and delivering life transforming therape therapeutics to patients. This is a very exciting time for Dine as we are driving three programs to the clinic very quickly. I, our program in DM1, DMD, and FSHD. We believe we have a lot of momentum behind our efforts here at Dine. Just a few weeks ago, we announced preclinical data demonstrating robust knockdown of toxic human nuclear DMPK and a novel in vivo model developed here at Dine that we believe sets a new standard for evaluating pharmacodynamics in DM1. Importantly, these data were generated with our fully human lead DM1 candidate. Ramesh will review these very exciting data in more detail, highlighting Dine's understanding of DM1 and our commitment to achieving life transforming disease modification by targeting the genetic basis of disease. These results build on Dine's robust portfolio of preclinical data generated over the last two years and provide further validation that Forest has the potential to deliver on our promise for patients. Dine was founded with a sincere focus on building the world's leading muscle disease company. We designed our Force platform to overcome the current limitations of muscle tissue delivery with modern oligonucleotide therapeutic candidates. Our newest data in DM1 validate our understanding of muscle biology, the importance of targeting the genetic base, basis of disease, and, did not, and Dine's commitment to delivering real disease modification. DM1 requires knockdown of toxic nuclear DMPK, and we achieved that with the FORCE platform. We expect to submit INDs for all three of our programs between the fourth quarter of 2021 and the fourth quarter of 2022. DM1 and DMD are, are the company's co-lead programs and are anticipated in the early part of that window with our FSHD program about a quarter or two behind. We've been very fortunate and recruited a management team with unparalleled expertise in muscle and building companies that can deliver on our promise to patients and our vision of becoming the world's leading muscle disease company. We're also very fortunate to have world-class uh, world board and a world-class scientific advisory board and to have leading healthcare investors supporting our vision. On slide five, you'll see the Dynesforce platform consists of three parts, a proprietary antigen binding fragment antibody or a FAB, which binds to the transparent one receptor and enables targeted delivery to muscle, a clinically validated linker, and the payload, again, that's selected to target the genetic basis of each disease we're looking at here at Dine. We chose a proprietary FAB antibody because we believe it offers powerful advantages over monoclonal antibodies or MABs to enable targeted, effective delivery of nucleic acids and other molecules to skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Our optimized FAB binds to TFR1, which is highly expressed on the muscle cells, without interfering with iron homeostasis, which is the natural function of TFR1. While MABs bind to TFR1, we know from our own work and literature that MABs lead to degradation of TFR1, and this can decrease the amount of drug that can be loaded into a cell. FABs are also much smaller in size, thus providing enhanced ability to reach the surface of muscle fiber. And by using a FAB, we can dose roughly two thirds less protein, and we believe have a very nice safety pro and tolerability profile for the force platform. Again, we've selected a ValSit linker for our platform based on its serum stability and our clinically validated safety and efficacy that we see in approved products. And we believe this further de-risks uh, our chance to take force to the clinic and be successful with patients. The force platform provides flexibility to deploy different types of therapeutic payloads that are rationally selected to match the target biology for each program. And our goal is to address the genetic basis of disease and potentially stop or reverse disease progression. Where disease-modifying nuclear knockdown is key, as in the case in DM1, it's critical that we selected a payload that gets pre preferentially trafficked to the nucleus. And for this reason, we designed a proprietary ASO payload that targets the toxic or mutant DMPK in the nucleus, which then will release splicing proteins and ultimately, we believe, restore function. 
So on slide six, I'm just mentioning that we believe force provides significant advantages over other approaches by delivering targeted, reducible, titratable, safe and effective therapies, which we believe can be used chronically. This is very uh, tunable for patients, as I like to think about it, and uh, provides a lot of advantage for us to reach all kinds of patients that suffer from this disease and our ability to tune uh, the force platform. We have demonstrated extended durability up to 12 weeks in vivo. We think about dose and dose regimen for patients, really trying to, to have a long duration of, of effects so we can deliver uh, less frequent dosing for patients. Um, and right now we're, sub, we're uh, IV dosing um, is what we expect for our dosing regimen. And I think we've seen the results out to uh, you know 12 weeks. So really favorable dosing and dose regimen profile that we see to date in the clinic are in, in, uh, in our animal studies and ultimately looking to see how far we can take that dosing regimen as we get into the clinic. On slide seven, just a few more comments on the team. Some of you, some of you who are, are with me today, I mentioned Ramesh, our co-founder. You all know Molly and we're very lucky to have her helping us at Dine to make important connections with members of the community. I wanna highlight a couple of others. Oksana Beskrovnaya, our SVP of research, joined Dine after a very long and distinguished career at Sanofi Genzyme. Susanna High just joined uh, about six, seven months ago. She, she serves as our chief operating officer and brings significant operational and strategic ex, uh, experience during her time at Bluebird and Alnylam. And she also has deep roots in rare disease. Deb Feldman's our head of regulatory. She joined us from SAGE. And we really have been very fortunate to assemble quite a team here at Dying to lead us uh, and lead our programs into the clinic. On slide eight, before I turn things over to Ramesh to review the data in a bit more detail, I want to reiterate that at Dine, again, we're focused on making uh, benefit for patients and really modifying disease. The slide illustrates the potential of the force platform with preclinical data demonstrating functional benefit across multiple indications in well-validated disease models using different payloads. So you're seeing across a couple of different diseases we're seeing, you know, that, that continued success and real disease modification potential with, with our preclinical data. And the DM1 program we'll show you today, DMPK knockdown, will show you foci degradation in the nucleus that drives splicing changes resulting in change of myotonia and the HCLR model that Ramesh will go through. We'll also share the new preclinical data I mentioned earlier where our lead candidate DM1 demonstrated robust knockdown of toxic human DMPK. And we really believe that again model really sets the standard uh, for all uh, thinking about pharmacodynamics and DM and DM1. And DMD, uh, using the MDX model, will highlight the data that demonstrate effective exon skipping and significant increase in dystrophin expression at the sarcolemma. This leads to reduced serum CK levels, which ultimately, again, de de delivers functional benefit. These preclinical studies are representative of dying scientific rigor, and we conduct our studies at third parties with controls, often blinded, using our full force conjugate, our FAB payload and linker, in all of our studies. This gives us the best robust data set to really think about how to evaluate our programs and getting to patients in, in a de-risked and accelerated way, um, as we know there's real need here from these from patients. The data on the right-hand side of the page is uh, on slide 12 is really unparalleled in the field of DM1 and DMD, and we believe underscores the potential of the force to modify disease and deliver life transformative therapies for patients. With that, I'll turn it over to Ramesh. Ramesh? Great, thanks, Josh. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here and share some of our work with you. So we go to slide 10, just to give you a little bit of um, background. I'm sure you know a lot about DM1, of course. Uh, it's a mutation in the DMPK gene and is onset at any point. Life expectancy is in the 50s generally, and it's primarily a muscle phenotype. There's also a CNS aspect to it. It's a large population. And here we have a picture of Joachim Beckelman, a friend of Dine and a patient uh, afflicted with DM1. And uh, as you see, there are no approved therapies for myotonic dystrophy. At Dine, we truly believe that we are building a disease-modifying nuclear DMPK knockdown platform that not only has the potential to stop disease, but hopefully can also reverse progression. So let me take a moment to just uh, tell you about the genetic basis of the disease um, on the next slide. As you know, it's an autosomal dominant disorder and it's uh, expanded repeats, CTG and DNA, that's converted to CUG expanded repeats in RNA, which is the second panel from the left. So here you see that expanded repeats form these expanded hairpin loops represented as red loops. 
and they serve to sponge or bind a number of different splicing proteins, including muscle blind. Muscle blind here is represented as those yellow spheres. So those are stuck in the nucleus and they form clusters or foci that you can actually stain and visualize within the nucleus. Once those splicing proteins are bound, as you know, you cannot splice downstream RNAs, and you have a number of misspliced chloride channels, calcium channels, structural functional proteins like BIN1 that ultimately lead to the clinical problems, such as myotonia, muscle weakness, cardiac arrhythmias, and pulmonary abnormalities. So Dyne's therapeutic is a force conjugate, which is an antibody linker and a single-stranded antisense oligo. And it's particularly chosen to be a single-stranded oligo because it gets into the nucleus very efficiently and can degrade the toxic RNA within the nucleus. So to demonstrate that we actually have an effect on disease, we need to show that we can decrease those foci or clusters and that we can alter splicing and perhaps change phenotype. Let me walk you through some of the data. So in the next slide, we show you that FORCE targets toxic nuclear DMPK RNA and reduces nuclear CUG foci in DM1 patient cells. So these are patient-derived myotubes that have been differentiated. And on the left side, you see a panel of myotubes treated with PBS or control. So here, the nuclei are stained blue. So you see those round circular nuclei. And within those, you see those toxic RNA clusters that are stained red. As you can observe, those toxic RNA clusters are only over the nucleus. They're not seen in the cytoplasm. Now, when we treat these cells with our molecule, the dyne panel on the right, it's a single low dose of our full conjugate, and we demonstrate significant decrease in those toxic RNA foci or those red clusters. And when we measure the whole field, it's about 40% with a single dose, which is fantastic, we believe. So next, we need to demonstrate we can splice. So in patient cells in vitro, on the next slide, slide 13, we show you that FORCE targets toxic, toxic nuclear DMPK RNA and corrects splicing. So you have the y-axis, the vertical axis is BIN1 exon 11 inclusion, and x-axis is the treatments. So on the black bar is PBS treated. You see there's only about 10% exon 11 inclusion in the BIN1 RNA. Now, when we treat with our molecule, the dyne molecule in the blue bar, we see about 30% inclusion of exon 11. It tells us that we're de delivering via the transferrin 1 receptor. Our molecules get into the cell, they migrate to the nucleus, they degrade the toxic RNA, and they're releasing sufficient splicing proteins to alter splicing of one of the key structural functional proteins in muscle, BIN1. So we've extended this work into, on the next slide, on slide 14, to one of the models that's well known in the field. And here we show you that force dose dependently corrected splicing and reverses myotonia in the HSA LR DM1 mouse model. Now, the HSA LR DM1 mouse model represents one of the few models that has a clinical phenotype, which is myotonia that's also seen in patients. And it has a number of RNAs that are misspliced, similar to what you see in patients. So we administered our drug intravenously, single doses, and then we measured splicing within the muscles of these mice. So on the left side, we show you splice correction in these muscles. So if you just take that box on the extreme left that says quadriceps, the y-axis is the splicing derangement with the green bar at the bottom representing wild-type splicing. And there are various treatments. Red circle is a vehicle-treated cohort, Green circle is 10 milligrams per kilogram of our dyne molecule. Blue is 20 milligrams per kilogram of our dyne molecule. As you see, as we increase our dose, there's a dose-dependent correction of splicing towards wild type. And you see it in three separate skeletal muscles. And it's really important to remember that each of these spots is actually a composite splicing score taken from the analysis of 35 different RNAs within the mouse muscle. And these RNAs are the chloride channel, calcium channel, and other RNAs such as I mentioned earlier, BIN1. Tells us that we are altering splicing similar to what we would like to see in patients. 
And this profound change in splicing across all these RNAs, we believe is also responsible for what you see on the right-hand side, which is a change in myotonia. On the right-hand side, let me walk you through it. The y-axis is myotonia grade measured by electromyography. On the x-axis are the various muscles and treatments. In black, the black bars are PBS or control treated mice. So you see a high level of myotonia, grade three. Red is the naked antisense oligo treated mouse. And there you see a slight decrease in myotonia, but still not uh, significant. In blue is our FAB conjugate from Dyne. And it's a antibody linker, and it's connected to the very same oligo used for those red bars. But just because of our targeted delivery to muscle, now you see almost a complete reversal of myotonia in these mice with a single low dose of our molecule. And to put it in context, when you compare it to published data by others in this field, others have required perhaps eight doses over one month, and each dose was 25 milligrams per kilogram. Here we are using one dose of 20 milligrams per kilogram over a couple of weeks and showing significant decrease in myotonia. Very exciting data for us, and we hope to translate this into clinic. We've advanced our work further, as you see on the next slide, in a model that we call the HTFR1 DMSX cell model. It is an innovative model developed by Dyne to evaluate PD or pharmacodynamics by measuring toxic human nuclear DMPK knockdown. So let me walk you through how we achieve this model. We developed a mouse model, which you see on the left-hand side, which expresses human transferrin 1 receptor. And we cross those mice with the DMS Excel model. And that is a model that expresses human DMPK RNA with over a thousand repeats, signifying a quite a severe DM1 phenotype. Now, these mice, as you see on the right hand side, they have the TFR1 receptor that enables us to use our clinical TFR1 targeting antibodies and our conjugates. And within the nucleus, you have toxic human DMPK RNA that is stuck in the nucleus, very similar to what you would see in patients. However, in this mouse model, the expression is quite low. About tenfold less human DMPK RNA is produced versus mouse DMPK RNA. So we do believe that we are underestimating some of the potency that we see in this model. So let's share some of the data with you. On slide 16, we demonstrate that with two doses of our molecule, we can see significant knockdown in these mice. So the human force conjugate demonstrated robust toxic RNA knockdown in our model. As you see, there are four panels, four different muscles, tibialis anterior, gastrocnemius, heart, and diaphragm. The y-axis is DMPK knockdown, and the x-axis is the treatments. The black bars are, again, control or PBS-treated mice. Now, two doses of our molecule for a total of 20 milligrams per kilogram significantly decreased the toxic human RNA that is stuck within the nucleus, similar to what you see in patients, in these mice. So we see significant knockdown, greater than 50% in most of the muscles, and that's the target range that we think will be clinically relevant in patients as well. So very exciting data and a model that we think sets the standard for many of our the drugs for DM1. So advancing to the next slide, what I'd like to share with you is just a comparison of our work with what's published. Here we show you that a low dose of force achieved rapid human toxic DMPK knockdown, while a naked ASO tested in the DMSXL model required high doses and prolonged exposure. So let me walk you through the panel on the left, which is the heart. The y-axis is again human DMPK knockdown. X-axis is the total antisense oligo dose. In blue is the dyne molecule, and the arrow is going from top to bottom signified knockdown. So in the blue square, you see two doses of a molecule for a total of 20 milligrams per kilogram decreases human DMPK nuclear RNA to 60%. And it does so within two weeks. On the, to the right of it, you see various triangles. The first red triangle is a total of 150 milligrams per kilogram. 
Second one is a total dose of two, 300 milligrams per kilogram. The third triangle is a total dose of 600 milligrams per kilogram. Administered multi with multiple doses over 44 days. So as you see in the heart, others uh, dosing these mice, DMS Excel mice with naked ASOs have required about 600 milligrams per kilogram to achieve the same level of knockdown that we achieved with about 20 milligrams per kilogram. It's about 30 fold um, more oligo required. So that is the value of targeted delivery with the force conjugate, which delivers low amounts of oligo specifically to the muscle to alter disease. So just to put that in context. And as we advance into primates on the next slide, we show you that we can achieve enhanced distribution in wild type DMPK knockdown across multiple skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles in primates. So as you know, primates, they're only wild type primates. There are no disease models. So all the DMPK RNA is in the cytoplasm. There is no DMPK RNA that's stuck in the nucleus. So it's not a great model to translate to humans, but we use it for distribution and for tolerability assessments of our drug. So here we show you that we can get a delivered to a number of these muscles that are important for DM patients, and we can engage target even though it's in the cytoplasm and decrease it. Now on the next slide, we show you that in filtering organs, such as liver, spleen, kidney, wherein naked oligos have had problems, our force molecule demonstrated muscle specificity. In red is the naked ASOs, and you see they do show quite a bit of knockdown in some of the tissues, while in blue is the dyne molecule showing minimal to no knockdown in these tissues, primarily because the antibody is driving distribution into muscles. So very excited by that. And we also looked at the monkeys for tolerability. So as I show you on the next slide, we looked in primates at a number of different analytes, and we showed that it's well tolerated in primates with our single dose studies here. And we pulled out two analytes, reticulocytes and platelets. And reticulocytes, we want to make sure that we are not affecting iron transport, and we do not. Multiple rodent and primate studies tell us that we are not affecting iron transport based on reticulocyte assessments, RBC numbers, and hemoglobin content as well. We also do not affect platelet numbers. Um, in, the pre in the past, with high doses of oligonucleotides, naked oligonucleotides, there have been instances of thrombocytopenia, so we want to, we don't expect it, but we monitor it, of course. And we do not see any changes in platelet numbers with our treatments. Neither do we see any changes in liver or kidney function or body weight, so we're very happy with the safety profile of our drug, and we're moving this forward towards the clinic. Lastly, to share with you our durability. As Josh had mentioned, with single doses on the next slide, we've demonstrated that our target knockdown shown in the blue bars lasts with a single dose up to about 12 weeks. So we're very excited by this durability where we had initially thought about perhaps monthly dosing, now entertaining the possibility of quarterly dosing. And we're refining those dose paradigms as we get towards the clinic. So to summarize our DM1 program on the next slide, what I've shown you today is very exciting and compelling preclinical data that tells us we can target the toxic DMPK RNA in the nucleus, in patient cells, and in animal models. We have robust knockdown of human toxic RNA within the nucleus. We reduce those foci, cause splicing changes. We can distribute to one of the very well-known models at DMS Excel that expresses human toxic RNA and decrease it to significant levels. And we have durability and tolerability that gives us confidence as we move towards clinic. And we're leveraging a tractable development plan with a rapid path to human proof of concepts. So DM1 program will be one of the few INDs that we will file in the one year timeframe between Q4 2021 and Q4 2022. So with that, I'll pass it over to Chris to walk through our clinical plans. Thanks very much, Ramesh. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Mix and it's a real privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I wanna give you an overview to start with the, of the drug development process and how we take the exciting molecules that Ramesh described uh, and how those eventually become therapies for patients with myotonic dystrophy. 
I then want to say a few words about how Dyne specifically is approaching the development of therapies for patients with myotonic dystrophy, and then close by addressing a handful of the many excellent questions we've received from you before the meeting. I'll then hand the presentation back over to Josh for some uh, concluding remarks and an opportunity for you to ask additional questions. So let's walk through the drug development process and some of the terminology that's used to describe it. Starting on the left-hand side of the slide in the blue bars, we have research, drug discovery, and preclinical studies. And this is the body of work that generates the exciting data that Josh and Ramesh have just finished describing to you. It's often the case that thousands of potential molecules are screened in order to find just a handful that enter into preclinical studies. Uh, and from those, we look for one that meets our criteria for advancement into studies in humans, also what we also call clinical trials. Clinical trials shown in the middle of the slide in the red bars are conducted in sequential phases in which as we progress through, we're progressively learning more and more about the safety of a drug in humans and whether that drug is successful in treating disease as, as we intended to. We start in phase one. Uh, these studies tend to be the smallest studies that we conduct. They may, for example, include only a single dose of treatment. Uh, and uh, our focus in these early studies is mainly on safety and understanding pharmacokinetics or PK, which is what happens to the drug once it enters the body. The next set of studies, what we call phase two in the middle, uh, still focus on safety, still focus on PK, but in these studies, we might for the first time be giving multiple doses of the drug. In addition, we're starting to look for first evidence that the drug is doing what we expect it to do to treat disease. And then finally, in phase three, we're trying to generate definitive evidence that the drug is providing benefit to patients uh, and a definitive assessment of the safety of that drug. These studies tend to require the largest sample sizes. It's not unusual for this entire process from research through to approval of a therapy to take up to 10 years. And we understand that this is an important source of frustration uh, for the patient community. And it's why we work very, very hard to find more efficient ways to get from the beginning to the end. And fortunately, in rare disease, it's often possible to do that. You'll see at the bottom of the slide, the letters IND and NDA. And I'm gonna say more about those in an upcoming slide. But first, let's say a few more words about preclinical studies. So, Preclinical studies embody everything that we have to do before we administer the drug to humans. We need to do these studies to tell us as much as possible about the drug uh, and to ensure that participants in clinical trials won't be exposed to unreasonable risks when they receive the drug. These studies have a number of different objectives, uh, which we'll cover as we walk from the left-hand side of the slide over to the right. So, First and foremost, these studies tell us about the safety of our drug. Uh, in addition, they characterize what I referred to earlier as pharmacokinetics, um, what we can think of as what happens to the drug once it enters the body. How long does it stay in the bloodstream? Where does it go? How does it, dis how does it uh, get cleared from, from the body? Finally, we look at what's called pharmacodynamics or PD. These are measures that start to tell us about whether the drug is having its intended effect to ultimately treat disease. We use all of this information to help design a clinical trial. Uh, in particular, we might use it to figure out a safe and reasonable starting dose. And we use it to uh, inform our approach to monitoring the study for safety, what kinds of tests uh, do we need to do and observations do we need to make to ensure that the drug is safe? Lastly, we take all of this information, we provide it to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, so that they can make their own decisions about whether the drug is ready to be tested in humans. 
So two additional terms you might hear that are very important to this process are IND and NDA. We mentioned these on uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, slides ago, and these these terms describe two very important ways in which we work with the FDA uh, through the drug development process. The IND uh, is otherwise known as the Investigational New Drug Application. We can think of this as a request for permission from the FDA to conduct the first clinical trial in humans. The application includes all of the preclinical work that's been done. It would also uh, say something about the way we manufacture the drug. Can we do that reliably? And lastly, it would include the study design for that first in human trial. We then embark on our studies. And once we've conducted all of the necessary phases of, of clinical trials and, and, and we're satisfied with the results, those data get packaged for review by the FDA in what's called an NDA or new drug application. And this is what enables the FDA to make a decision about approving the drug and making it available to patients more broadly. Uh, if we turn now to think about how Dine specifically thinks about the development of therapies for, for DM1. So at Dine, we feel that the path to a successful drug development lies in very close collaboration with the best research and medical experts in the DM1 field, uh, and in particular, working very closely with the patient community to ensure that the studies we design are sensitive to the needs of patients. With respect to where Dyne currently stands in its drug development path, as shown by the data Ramesh shared, we've already conducted years of preclinical research. We have good insights into uh, DM1 and, its, and the disease process, but we're continuing to build on that understanding and how DM1 impacts families through several key efforts. First, we're a partner in the definitive study, natural history study in DM1 called the END DM1 trial. Secondly, we are in the midst of a multi-year planning process with experts in the field of myotonic dystrophy, including Charles Thornton, who is a member of Dine Scientific Advisory Board, uh, and finally, we've conducted and will continue to conduct interviews and workshops with families affected by this disease, again, so that we can use that information uh, in our clinical trial design. Our ultimate goal is to pull together all of the information we gather from each of these efforts and use it to design trials that provide us the answers we need with respect to safety and efficacy as quickly as possible. So again, we, uh, we really appreciate all the fantastic questions that we received from the community prior to, uh, prior to the presentation today, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask additional questions. Uh, but let's, let's, let's turn to these. So first, when will, clinical, when will Dine's clinical trial begin? Uh, we again want to assure everyone that we're moving as quickly as possible to advance our therapy to the clinic. You'll recall, uh, as Ramesh indicated, that the IND application we talked about earlier that FDA reviews to give us permission to start our clinical trial, we're going to submit an IND for each of the three lead programs, including DM1, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and FSHD, somewhere between the end of this year and the end of next year, keeping in mind that the DM1 program and the DMD program are in the earlier portion of, of that time window. Next question, where are your clinical trial locations? So we're reviewing a broad array of possible sites for conduct of the trial where we think it would be ideal to conduct the study. Ultimately, when it's time to launch the trial, we will provide information about the study, including sites through our advocacy partners, through clinicaltrials.gov and through a variety of additional communication channels. Uh, next question is, 
how can I participate in the trial or will I be able to participate in the trial? When the trial is launched, it will be important and, you're inter and if you are interested in participating, it will be important for you to talk to your doctor about whether this uh, trial, the one that we've proposed and designed, is ideal for you. Finally, what can you say about the design of the trial? For example, its length, number of subjects, will it include placebo control, among other design characteristics? So first, we appreciate that it is absolutely critical for patients to have this information to understand whether a study is right for them. Uh, you will be able to understand the design of the trial when we communicate it uh, at the time of launch through our advocacy partners and through additional communication channels. I'll end there and hand it back over to Josh. I would like to thank everybody. That concludes the presentation. I don't know if there's any, any additional questions. I think we have some time, so we'd be happy to take those. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. Um, if we're going into q and A, I'd like to invite Molly back up as well. And the questions have been coming through during the presentation. So those have been collected and we would love for you to go ahead and begin to answer. Thank you. Okay, um, it is, again, it's a pleasure to see. I wish we could see you guys in person. Um, I have some very dear friends in this community and hopefully we will all be in the same place at the same time in the near future. But in the meantime, we got some wonderful questions from you guys. Um, some of them, of course, we can't yet answer, but we'll take all the ones that are that are possible to address. And I know one question that the team, uh, the community living with DM has is, you know, how uh, will these how will these potential therapies um, work with people living with DM2? So Ramesh, maybe you'd like to take that one. Sure, Molly. So as you all know, Dyne is laser focused on developing life transforming therapies for patients with muscle diseases. And we are currently focused quite uh, um, steadily on DM1 and particularly patients with the muscle phenotype. But as we develop our platform and our clinical program, we do intend to address uh, the entire scope of both DM1 and hopefully DM2 as well, as well as other muscle diseases. So we do plan to address it in the future as we build a company. There's a couple, couple questions around how well this potential therapy will work in the heart. Ramesh or, or Josh, you wanna tackle that? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I, we know it's an incredibly important component of, uh, you know, restoring function and really addressing this disease. And I think what we've been encouraged by to date is across our preclinical data and across programs, we're seeing great targeted delivery uh, to heart as well as skeletal and smooth muscle tissue. So we're focused on that. It's a key component of how we think about really being able to change lives of patients uh, with DM1. And um, so far, I'd say we feel like we've got a great start to it. And I think if you look at the data we've generated uh, compared to all the historical data uh, in delivering to heart, we're, we're significantly getting there. So uh, we'll have to wait to the clinic to see ultimately what that means. But so far, we feel pretty good about being able to get targeted delivery to the heart. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions here around whether or not the current therapy, potential therapy, will address uh, symptoms in the brain. Ramesh, maybe you want to tackle that? Sure. So we've optimized our course platform currently for muscle delivery. So as we leverage the transfer one receptor for muscle delivery, there are certain characteristics that we've designed into the antibody that preferentially gets into muscle, um, but not yet to brain. But we do have a slate of antibodies with different affinities that we can leverage to try and get across the BBB. So that is in our plan. We are currently focused on addressing about 75 to 80% of the DM1 population. But as we um, develop that program, we also want to help the rest of the community, the remaining 20% that also have serious CNS defects. And Molly, I would add to that, you know, for everyone listening, that as a company, you know, to build the world's leading muscle disease company and to really address DM1 in totality, we are we are going to focus on all the different um, you know issues that are associated with DM1, including CNS. 
It just takes some time for us to get there. We're again, focused on the largest majority of, of the issues that we hear about when we talk with patients. And we have the, 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 the technology and the force platform to address other components as well, including CNS. And that just takes some time for us to do. But it's part of our, 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 um, our commitment to the community that we will be addressing uh, in time with the design force platform, all of DM1. That's fantastic news. Um, here's a question for maybe we'll start with Josh. Uh, is your therapy similar to what Ionis tried a few years ago? That's a great question. I mean, I think if, as we think about, you know, Ramesh here and our founder and what he was thinking about when he put this company together, the issue has been always with Oligos delivery. So whether we're thinking about Galnac and delivery to the liver with Oligos, uh, or trying to deliver naked oligos that are untargeted oligos. They just, they're just given systemically and then hope they get to the right place. And that's why, you know, those programs historically have failed because they are getting into places we don't want them to get to causing toxicity and, you know, not really delivering the benefits for, for patients. Our approach is similar in the fact that we use a similar ASO type of payload, but we are targeting it through the delivery with the fab or the antibody to use that TFR1 receptor to, to lead the payload uh, that will be responsible for changing the disease to the actual muscle. And that's why we call it targeted delivery. And I think that's a really important differentiation. A lot of companies have been out there spending time, whether you hear a lot about gene therapy or gene editing, they still have to deliver that technology to the right tissues in the right place in the body. And that's what force is all about, really targeting delivery to the muscle. Maybe start with Ramesh on this one. Would a drug to help DM1 reverse symptoms or just halt deterioration? Are you going to get reversed in symptoms or just slowing or stopping progression? That's a great question. So as the community knows, it's primarily a splicing disorder. So you have splicing, for example, in one of the channels whereby it's not functioning at the right levels. So as we correct splicing, we do believe that we can reverse progression as well in DM1, particularly because the muscles are not, uh, you don't have as much fat or fibrosis in, in DM1 as you have, may have in other muscle diseases. So there's a capacity to actually reverse the progression of disease, which is very exciting. And we hope we can get there with our medicines. Uh, we have a question here, what is the most, what is the most significant obstacle to producing a treatment for DM1? Chris, you want to take this one? Yes. Uh, so with the obstacles, I think right now it's mainly some of the biomarkers. It's thinking about clinical development. And uh, so we are very much involved and looking forward to learning more from our NDM1 study with a lot of the KOLs and the sites. That'll give us a great uh, look into what could be uh, medicines that truly bring back function for these patients. So that's where I would say there's a little bit of uh, area for us to develop. But um, Chris, you want to add anything to it? No, I think you know it's true for all rare diseases that that uh, as researchers we benefit a lot from natural history studies to understand how. The disease affects patients over time and I, we expect a lot of good information to come out of the NDM1 natural history study. Uh, you know what, what are the things that predict uh, the progression of disease in patients for example those kinds of information are going to be helpful to us in designing the right clinical trials for patients. Here's one maybe Josh you want to take this time to differentiate from others in the space of DM1. Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me okay, Molly and yeah. team? Yeah. Okay. I mean, look, I think differentiation is not just about your technology, which the force platform is clearly differentiated from others in the space that are, you know, trying similar approaches or trying to, uh, you know, target the disease in general. I think our differentiation starts with a couple of things. One, our focus on muscle. So we really are a company that's been focused squarely on muscle diseases and the three that three key programs that we talked about today that provides us a uh, great ability to not get distracted by where else we could take our force platform which has lots of other applications uh you know with this great technology that we've, we've developed here at dine i think the other thing is the team we put together really understands muscle um and 
has a real connection for the patient community. I mean, I, I know you guys know Molly really well. Molly's been an amazing uh, force, if you will, behind uh, Dine's approach to really trying to connect to patients, understand patients. This rare disease day that we had with Yoakum, uh, you know, personally touched me. We had I had my two or three of my young boys attended, and you know, the question that was just answered about what stands in the way of getting um, a therapy to, to patients and the thing that I struggle with most is time. This, how fast can we do it? Because there's a, there's a, such a huge need in the space, and it's almost unacceptable as a society. We don't have a an answer here for for people with DM1. So, I think it's our true commitment to patients, our focus on muscle, and although we've got a very differentiated technology, you know, there's luck that's needed along the way, um, and I think uh, you know that differentiation of our focus and our commitment to patients is going to matter. I know we're at the one o'clock hour uh, West Coast time. Is it time for some more questions, Tanya, or uh, what do you advise? If you have a few more questions, absolutely. Um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've got one here. Um, how long does it take for the FDA to approve plans for a clinical trial once you've submitted the IND? Sure, usually after we submit the IND, we wait a 30 day period to hear back and uh, we'll either get feedback from the agency and if we don't, uh, then usually that means it's uh, it's okay to proceed. And I would just add to that Molly for everybody that you know, from an FDA perspective or any global regulatory agency, there's a great you know alignment of that comes together prior to filing that IND that Chris touched upon where you really work with each other and leverage the data that we have and the experience that we have from the, the natural history study and try and design an optimal study that one keeps patients safe first and foremost and allows us to explore these drugs, but also in a rare disease uh, specifically, try and drive as quickly as possible to see if we can get something to patients. So the FDA is really aligned on that. And uh, usually once you submit your package, if you've done a good job, answer on all their questions in advance of that, you know, the meeting, the pre-IND meeting, things of that nature, the IND is more of a formality. And so that's what we're preparing for on our side to make that as streamlined as possible so that once we submit the IND, we can get dosing patients. The one thing I can tell you is if there's patients on the phone or, or people that are suffering from DM1, tell your care providers, tell, tell the people, the physicians you work with to, uh, to, to do what they can to, to help us get the drug to you through the clinic, through the site, so that we can deliver it quickly and 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 enroll patients more quickly. Because that's where lots of times we see delays in our studies where we just can't get the, the, the number of patients on drug quick enough to enroll these studies uh, to really evaluate them. All right, I've got one last question here um, and I'll let you, uh, I'll, maybe we can let um, Chris start, but anybody jump in. Will it be necessary to do a phase three trial of, of uh, our potential therapy because there's no standard treatment? I think it's 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 early to say. We'll uh, we'll learn a lot as as we go and as as the data come in from our clinical trials, uh, there will be a decision making process involved uh, that that helps us inform next steps. Josh, anything to add? I would just say that um, you know. At some point, you're going to need a, a confirmation study regardless, right? So our goal is, can we get it approved in an accelerated way to get to patients and still study the drug while it's approved? But ultimately, yes, we'll need a, a confirmation study. Um, and, and that's all part of what I was just mentioning is the dialogue and the partnering with the FDA and global regulatory agencies before you even get to that stage. So they'll give us a chance, hopefully, to get to patients sooner, but still evaluate it and then confirm that. Uh, in that confirmation study as we go through, you know, a full approval uh, for, for the drug candidate. Excellent. There were some other questions I don't think we're going to be able to get to. Um, anybody on the phone that would like to follow up, we are happy to take your questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis, either via email or phone. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, it's been, I, I want to echo Josh, it's been delightful to get to meet with you all today, even if it is through screens and unfortunately distant. We're really looking forward to seeing you all in person sooner than later, me in particular. And um, we just want to thank the Myotonic District Foundation for letting us have this conversation with you. And we apologize for some of the um, technical hiccups that have uh, been a part of this whole presentation. So thanks very much. 
Thank you all for being here today, helping us kick off Rare Disease Month, and we're especially grateful to help us kick off this series. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to talking with you again very soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.